Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to be in your presence. We thank you for every person here, every family represented here, everyone that's on their way, everyone that couldn't make it, Lord, but desires to be here. We pray that you just keep your hand over each of us, Lord God. I pray that today you reveal something new. Your word is eternal. But I thank you that we can read the same scripture a thousand times to get 2,000 different revelations. So, Lord, speak to us in this moment. Have your way during this time. I pray that your Holy Spirit governs the entire time, the, every conversation, Lord God, so that we leave better than we came and that at the end of it all, you will get the glory. So we love you. We honor you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're going to look at Matthew 2. And I said that Wednesday service is more chill and laid back, but the purpose of Wednesday is really to get into the word. Sunday, there's not a lot of opportunity for dialogue, you know, during the message. Um, You know, we're in a tight timeline. But Wednesday, we really want to peel back the word, get into it, ask questions about it, sharpen one another on it, figure out how we can apply this to our lives today. What does it mean, right? What does it look like to walk this out? So this is this is the time to really go in. Um, and in the early church, the, in the book of Acts, it tells us that the apostles got together. Um, the, the church got together. They studied the apostles' teaching. They broke bread. They fellowshiped. They prayed, right? So this is the part of, about studying the teaching, really getting into it, breaking bread, having conversation. And so um, when we look at Matthew 2, I'm just going to read it um, starting in verse 1, and I'll just read until the Holy Spirit tells me to stop. <laughs> Um, but I'm reading New Living, New Living Translation. Uh, verse 1 starts as, uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Verse 3, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is this Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. (laughs) Verse 9. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Verse 13, after the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Let's skip to verse uh, 16. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. I'll stop right there. So I want us to talk about, there's several different things that stand out about that scripture. 
But based on what we've been discussing here in Activate, we've been putting a lot of emphasis on the gifts that God has given us, right? We talked about the parable of the talents and how God gave each of them something of value. He told them to, um, well, he gave it to them and he left. And he had an expectation that they would work their gift because they would have to, at some point, account for it. But they never knew when their master was going to come back to check up on what he had left them with. When he came back, two people worked the gift. One person didn't. That one person was considered a wicked, and lazy servant. Uh, you actually asked about laziness a couple weeks ago. Um, so I want to I look at this scripture from the lens of how we are supposed to protect the gift that is in us and the threat of that gift that is in us. You see in the scripture where Herod found out about Jesus about to be born and was deeply disturbed. Herod in this text to me represents the rulers of this earth, of this world, right? Jesus represents the thing God put inside of you to bring about God's glory in the earth. So to answer a question that was asked a couple weeks ago, and it, it, this just came to me, um, why is it that we find we have trouble working and doing the thing necessary to bring our gifts to the world? It's not that we're lazy by happenstance. It's not that we're discouraged because we just don't feel like doing it. It's literally an attack of the enemy. Because if your gift is not birthed, then the rulers of this world continue to advance their agenda. King Herod was deeply troubled because he was a wicked king. He didn't want Jesus being born. He didn't want the idea of anybody other than him being seen as worthy to be worshipped. And so because he caught wind of this new Messiah coming, he wanted to kill it instantly. I compare that to whenever you get a good idea, a God idea rather, and you're excited about it, there's no coincidence that if you don't immediately act on it, it goes away, it dies. It's not by happenstance. It's literally because there is an opposition that is assigned to kill your gift before it even gets going. And even if you happen to take a step and do something, that force is still not going to stop. Herod said, find every boy that is under the age of two and kill him. We missed, we missed the opportunity to get him when he was first born. We missed the opportunity to get her when she first launched the book. We missed the opportunity to get him when he first started the business. We missed the opportunity to get them when they, when they first got in the marriage, in a godly marriage. But let's, let's, let's do whatever we need to do to kill it. Because we cannot have the kingdom of God advancing against the kingdom of this world. So these are the opposing forces that cause us to be lazy because at the end of the day when when jesus referred to that when god when the master referred to that one talent person as wicked and lazy that laziness was the result of that man's fear he told the master i know you to be a hard man and i was afraid so i hid your money so i want you to ask yourself if you ever find yourself in a, in a lazy procrastinating demeanor Ask yourself, what is the root of it? I'm sorry I keep looking at you, but you asked the question a couple weeks ago, so I keep, my eyes keep coming here, but I'm not, you know, this is for everybody. What is at the root of it? And another thing that is interesting is whenever we're not doing the thing that we know we need to do, we default to something that is purposeless. That's a key indication that we know we need to be moving in that gift because I'm too busy to start this now, so I'm just going to chill and watch YouTube for three hours. 
I don't have the time to invest in knowledge and invest in my gift and invest in the trade and invest in sharpening the thing that God gave me. Let me just scroll on social media for for four hours. Some of y'all have read more social media post captions than you have scripture. Just chill out real quick. Just let that simmer. Some of you, if you looked at your phone, I should do this next week. Everybody take out your phones and pull up that uh, screen time analytics. If you look at your screen time analytics over the course of a week, you probably spent as much time in social media apps that you could have read the entire New Testament. But our flesh defaults to purposeless activity because our flesh is sinful. So in order for us to do the thing that God has called us to do, we're going to have to work. Because the God idea, the God thing, faith, without our action, works, produces nothing, meaning dead. And so at Activate, our calling is to challenge you to be everything God called you to be. To challenge you to be everything that God has called you to be and to fight against the the natural tendency to be wicked and lazy. Our flesh is wicked and lazy. I had to check myself. There are certain things I enjoy doing, and those things take a lot of time. I like going out on my patio. I like grilling and smoking meat. That takes hours, and I would just sit out there and listen to the birds and a podcast. Now, it's a godly podcast. I'm not listening to trash, but God has been kind of speaking to me like, what could you be doing right now? Right? Other than the things that your flesh enjoys. And I know when he speaks to me, he's not just speaking to me for the sake of speaking to me. It's something because he knows I'm very transparent, transparent <laughs> that he knows I'm going to share it with you all. So I, I, I'd, I'd imagine that some of you struggle with that same thing. You know there's something more you should be doing, but you default to your flesh, which is wicked and lazy. And it is my responsibility and my obligation to call that thing out and to speak to the spirit of God that is in you and tell you to get up. And remind you of that thing that God told you to do. And remind you that the enemy's main job is not to necessarily kill you, but to kill the gift that God put inside of you. Because you can be walking around alive and your gift be buried and the enemy wins. And so the enemy will use anything. He will use bad experiences to discourage you. He will use fear to discourage you. He will use comparison to discourage you. He will use whatever he needs to hurt, pain, disappointment to discourage you from doing the thing that God called you to do. Because again, all he needs you to do is delay one more day. And then that one more day turns into one more month. And that one more month turns into the five years. And then next thing you know, your, your, your days are done. And God is asking, what did you do with what I gave you? And you're like, uh, I, I buried it, but here it is. And he's like, you wicked and lazy servant. I don't want to hear that. And so I'm going to revisit something that we talked about a few weeks ago. And I, none of y'all did the homework. I didn't forget. You did? Okay, let's give it up for you. Give it up for you. Okay. Now, I won't put you on stage yet. But I, I went through this for myself today, too. I really want you to... Go through the things that God has given you, the gifts that God has given you, and let's let's not make it negative. Let's make it positive. How could you be using those gifts to honor him? Because everybody has something. And so take take I I, I put myself through this through this um, scenario. One of the gifts God has given me is the ability to engage people. That's why I've been successful in sales. That's why I've been successful in ministry. That's why I've been successful 
um, in content that we create because God has given me an ability to engage people. Doesn't matter if you're five years old or 75, I can keep you engaged, right? How can I, how many ways can I use that gift to honor God? One is through preaching. When I was living in sin, I used it for my personal gain. And while I was, my flesh was satisfied, the people I could have been reaching for God's glory was not happening. So it was, it was dead fruit, right? But now he's showing me how that thing can be used. It can be used to preach his word. It can be used to edify his body. It can be used to the podcast that my wife and I are doing. It can be used for social media, glorifying him there. It can be used to just speak a word to somebody, not even on a public stage, right? And so what God has given you is a, has a multifaceted opportunity to bless people and to honor him and to glorify him. Right back there? No, you're good. I thought you sign language. Or, okay, cool. And look, you're good. Listen, man, I, I care about each of you. So if I see something, I want to make sure you're good. But what could you be using your gifts for? How many ways could you be using your gifts for? in order to, to, to glorify God. And remember, there's a King Herod that is out to literally kill your gift. Another thing I want to speak to is God's ability to communicate through dreams. He communicated to Joseph when he was about to divorce his fiance for getting pregnant before they consummated that thing, it's like, okay, I'm going to just go ahead and I'm, I'm just going to dip out because I know it ain't my baby. God communicated to him through the dream. When it was time for, when they actually had the, when Jesus was, was born, God communicated again through a dream. He also communicated to the wise men through a dream to not go back to Herod. So a lot of you have had Godly dreams. And it's very important. I learned this from my sister, Stephanie Ike. Shouts out to Pastor Stephanie. She just wrote a book about it, too. So get the book. Uh, Pre-order it. I learned from her. She preached a whole sermon on, like, just dreams and interpreting dreams. How important it is when you receive a God dream to make sure you hold on to it. Because what does our flesh want to do? when we wake up at 3.47 in the morning after having a God dream, right back to sleep. And what do we tell ourselves? Oh, I'll remember it. Uh, it, was too, it was too vivid of a dream. I'm going to remember that. And what happens when you hit the snooze button 17 times, you wake up at 9.42? Cannot remember the dream. It happens too often, right? And so because we know that God communicates through dreams. Let's fight the wicked and lazy flesh from robbing us of an opportunity to retain that thing when God speaks to us. Because I'm living in one of those dreams now. I shared it with y'all. But the night after she preached that sermon, <laughs> I had this dream. And long story short, it showed me and a younger version of my wife skipping around this neighborhood. It wasn't L.A. because there was grass and trees and clean air. But we look up now and I see that that dream was showing us our life in Alpharetta. It was literally the neighborhood that we're in. And this was back in, this was, this was six, what, when? Yes, five years ago, almost six years ago. And even down to the specificity of what my wife was going to be doing at the time. So, again, the scripture tells us how God communicates through dreams. I want us to value that communication. My role as leader, co-leader of Activate is to help activate the spirit that is in you. I don't want us to be, 
closed off to anything that God might be speaking, any avenue through which he might be speaking, okay? Dreams is one. Another thing I want to highlight are the people that God has assigned to protect and nurture your gift. The wise men, they didn't go back to Herod. They knew that if they went back to him, he was going to go and have Jesus killed. And have them kill. So they, by listening to the voice of God, bless you, protected and nurtured the gift. God has assigned certain people to your life. And if you pay attention, anytime you share something with them, there's never anything negative. There's encouragement. There's prayer. There's support. There's how can I help. But oftentimes we surround ourselves with people that will say they support, but they give you like, you get that gut feeling, get that feeling in your spirit that uh, this doesn't really feel like support. Feels like surface level support, but you say things like little in front of, you know, my dream. Oh, that's a cute little idea you got. I want us to be intentional about surrounding ourselves with people that are going to nurture and cultivate the gift that is in us. And that just means surrounding ourselves with kingdom people. And kingdom is not synonymous with Christian. Kingdom-minded means there is nothing in this world that impresses me. There is nothing in this world that I care to be impressed by, and I don't care to be admired. I care that God is glorified. So that means there is nothing that you could do to succeed that's going to threat anything that threaten anything that I have that God has given me. You being successful in what God has called you to do is a blessing to me. Me being successful in what God has called me to do is encouraging to you. You being good and and blessed in what God has called you to do is going to ignite something in you. And there is no jealousy. There's no competition because at the end of the day, all, all people care about in the kingdom is that God is glorified. Period. So examine your circles. Start, playing, start paying close attention to people and how they respond when you share something with them, when you share a dream with them, when you share a vision with them. It's another good homework assignment. Just next time, the next five people you talk to, just share them something that God has given you. Share them an idea that you want to bring to fruition and just sit back and examine their response. God is going to highlight if this is somebody that is there to nurture your gift, support you, or if it's somebody that's a little threatened or jealous by you. And just be mindful and spend your time accordingly based on what what he showed you in those moments. I have cut a lot of people off in the spirit and in the natural, with a smile on my face, and they have no idea. They just think I've been very busy, which I have. But you make time for, absolutely. So time is too precious for you to be walking around trying to um, appease people that you know aren't there for the right reasons. Life is too short for you to be in environments with people that God didn't intend for you to do life with. Life is too short to be a people pleaser. As we read through this chapter, in what ways can we apply any aspect of that to our lives today? Whether it's hearing the dream, hearing the voice of God, obeying it, or it's doing the hard thing that Joseph had to do to stay with this, this 
woman by faith that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit, which had never happened before, whether it was having to leave your comfort zone and, and literally be on the run with your family because just your, your existence was a threat to the enemy. Your, your mere existence was a threat to the world in which you were born into. Like the, the, the space that you're in, your presence is a threat to the entire space. So everything in the space seems to be against you, and you still have to find a way to navigate it. How do, how, how do we do that? Because as believers, that's the, going to be the reality in many situations. You're going to be the oddball. You're going to be the weird Christian person. You're going to be the one that's not doing everything that everybody else is doing because it doesn't line up with kingdom principles. It might line up with King Herod's rule, but you live by a higher standard. So how, how are you going to... Live your life in a world where there's a wicked leader, but you serve a righteous God. How do you navigate that? Come on up here. Knees are cracking, huh? She ain't, ain't no spring chicken no more. Knees is cracking. Welcome. Sneak through the house. So the practical part. Because I know a lot of people can, because we're all encased in flesh, we struggle with laziness or procrastination. You call it whatever you want. You know, how many of y'all binge watching a series or one or two or three? How many of you guys are watching movies? How many of you guys are scrolling social media? There's a lot of lavish distractions, endless, a plethora of distractions that are keeping us from really pressing in to God. And so a very simple yet effective measure to take is get an accountability partner. Before you leave here, exchange numbers with someone that you haven't already, or maybe you have, and just make it up in your mind. If you know you're struggling to pray, to read, we need, that's our spiritual food. We need to read. And praying is, a, we know that's warfare. It, it, really breaks us out of our fleshly shell and it gets us into the holy of holies. But get an accountability partner. Say, look, I'm struggling to pray before bed or I'm struggling to carve out this time because all these other things have my, my time. So just check in once a week or every day. Did you pray? Whatever it is, not set an alarm. Get an accountability partner. This is very, very effective. And you'll build a habit, and now you'll realize 21 days later, or however long it takes you to break that habit or create a new habit, you'll realize, I don't know what, what I was thinking. I can't believe I went this long without praying. And this happens to me all the time, and I've shared this with some of you, but have you ever, because I don't think I'm the only one, but... Whenever I pray, so the difference between praying with my understanding and praying in the spirit, I pray with my understanding, I reach a point where I'm like, okay, I'm just talking, let me pray in the spirit because I know God wants to do something. I immediately start yawning. And it'll be like a, one of those chain yawns, like one after the other, I'm like, what is this? And the Lord's like, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your flesh wants no parts to do with God. And when you pray in the spirit, you are literally shedding your flesh and building up your spirit man. I think about when Jesus was in the garden, you know, right before he was executed, he prayed and he asked his disciples to pray with me, watch with me. He also talked about, he identified prayer as watching. That's another teaching. But they fell asleep and he was praying. He came and was like, y'all sleeping? You can't watch, pray. He went back. And he, because he didn't want to go to the cross, his flesh didn't want to go to the cross, but he prayed until he received that power he needed to complete the mission. We know the whole story. They went back and forth. The disciples fell asleep. I think if they were praying with him, they would have received something crazy, but it was obviously God is in perfect order. But something happens when you pray, and I believe that praying, we walk, we're, we're supposed to worship in spirit and in truth. And the, Paul, when he says pray without ceasing, like how do you pray without ceasing? Praying in the spirit is a way to pray without ceasing. 
And it's also not just praying in tongues. It could just because you see scriptures where the Lord prayed in the spirit, but you don't see that it was tongues. He was just he was just praying in the spirit. We don't know. We, I wish I had a you know a screen to look back in time and see what did that look like. Praying in the spirit is also in truth. I know that I am the King of Glory. I know that these are my sheep, and I will bring them back to me. I know that my blood once it's shed, it's shed once and for all. He had to to wear that and prayer was a way that he did it and we must pray it's not an option if you want to walk in power and see God move and have relationship with him because think about it when you see people approaching the Lord in scripture at the end of the age where they're like didn't I do all these works in your name and he says get away from me I I knew you not wait a minute how am I casting out devils and prophesying but yet you're telling me I don't know you this is Intimacy is everything. And a fruit of knowing that you know the Lord is your humility. Because the Bible says that he resists the proud. The sa- I said this to you guys before, you, before we started. The safest place to be before the Lord is broken and in prostrate position. Praying, worshiping, reading, fellowshipping, having an accountability partner is a great way to start that. Let me jump in on that accountability partner thing. Make sure it's Holy Spirit led. Yes. Right. Yes. Because uh, yes, there's a possibility that discernment you could want an accountability partner that's cute. Discernment. And the Holy Spirit didn't tell you that. Your flesh told you that. Discernment. Zoom in on my face. Preferably accountability partner of the same sex. I'm kidding. You got to do that. No, no. Yes, we have to because we that's, that's the no, real I'm, fact. I'm talking about the zoom. But in even part. nowadays, you can't even do that. Can what? I said accountability partners of the same sex, but even nowadays you can't do that. Oh no! Nah. Like, yeah, I've been in a this part house. Of, you can. Hey, let me tell you something about this house, right? <laughs> so, and and I mean this with my whole heart. It is impossible to hide in the presence of God. This is why I tell all of my sisters: when you meet a guy and you think he's the one. <laughs> Bring him here. <laughs> One of two things are going to happen. Mm-hmm. If he's not it, he's not even going to come. Mm-hmm. Because it's impossible to hide in the presence of God. Mm-hmm. Not in the presence of me and Christina, in the presence of God. It's uncomfortable mm-hmm. if, you're, if you have a hidden agenda to walk into the presence of God. Mm-hmm. So anything that is not of the spirit is going to be exposed yeah. in this house. Um, so, yeah, bring them out. <laughs> if my, my guys, if you meet her, bring her out. See how these people that you're bringing into your life, if it's not activate, bring them into environments where you know the Holy Spirit is present. Meeting somebody at a hookah lounge ain't going to always reveal to you if God is approving this person. And I, I, I thank you, Holy Spirit. I, so just like I wanted my wife's dad's approval, you should want your heavenly father's approval. And if you don't have it, just like it, if Henry didn't tell me out of his own mouth, yes, you can have my daughter's hand in marriage, I would not have proposed. If you don't get confirmation from God that the people that you're considering during doing life with are approved by him, walk away. Period. Because your flesh is going to want what your flesh wants. But because we are followers of Christ and we are spirit beings and we live by a kingdom standard, we have to divorce the, ourselves from the flesh and 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 have allegiance to the spirit. What is God saying about this person? Mm-hmm. Forget financial stability. What's your spiritual stability? Because if, if you're spiritually stable, then the finances are going to be there. If you're spiritually stable, then the sex life after marriage is going to be there. Amen and hallelujah <laughs> three times. <laughs> if you're spiritually stable, literally everything that you could ask or imagine is going to be there. Mm-hmm. So let's prioritize the spiritual. Yeah. Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom and 
his righteousness, my favorite scripture. and all other things will be added unto you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that should be top of all of this that was said. Seek the Lord. Don't go in, okay, let me just work. No, 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 no. Hold up. Seek the Lord. See what he's calling you to do. It may just be stay, sit with me every day. After work, sit with me. And that's probably what it's going to be for a lot of y'all. Just sit with me. Watch what he does. We are pro-fasting and praying. I'm telling you, that thing does something to us. So if you know you need to go on a fast, do it. What do you have to lose? Go lose some weight. That's a lot of people's preferences anyway. Shoo. But you're going to gain so much knowledge. You're going to gain intimacy with the living God. And know him for yourself because there's so much stuff out there online, so much information coming from quote-unquote Christians, but it's confusing a lot of Christians. And it's, it's divisive and it's demonic and I can't stand it. And so I'm praying that, there's, there, that the Lord just you know, heals the church as a whole, but yeah, we have to know the Lord for ourselves. I think about the, the ten virgins, five are wise, five are foolish. That was, that's half of the church the oil is something that each virgin had for themselves some didn't some did and the oil could represent intimacy with the lord the holy spirit we know oil is jesus anointing he was crushed bruised when you think about the oil process the vegetable or fruit is crushed so detailed intricate process to get some oil so that is precious and we have to really value our time, our relationship with God, it has to be before everything. Before morning Joe, coffee. Last thing I'm going to say is this. Okay. What you just said about the toxicity in, in, in the, the conflict and the confusion with some of the content that's going out in Christian spaces, yeah. um, the answer to that is your gift being birthed. So instead of being a consumer, Mm -hmm. be a producer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's the answer to a lot of this that we see. Mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, the the people that create reaction videos to preachers and, and they're challenging everything that they say word for word, taking little clips, saying that they're not preaching the gospel, a more effective use of your time would be to preach the gospel. Do a Bible study, do a prayer. If you think that whoever this person is is not preaching the gospel, why are you giving them extra attention to point out that they're not preaching the gospel if your true heart posture is about wanting the gospel to be preached? Mm -hmm. The reality is there's a check that comes with, a monetary uh, return that comes with likes and views and Mm -hmm. attention, right? Yeah. Yeah. You have to be careful. But in the book of Matthew, Jesus, went, he was very specific. He was like, hey, whatever you do, do it unto me. Mm-hmm. Anything you do for attention, like that's your reward. Mm-hmm. But if you're really about serving me, do, do it in the secret place. Yeah. Don't pray out in public saying all these big words because you want to be seen and heard and you want to be admired. Those people have their reward. But you who follow me, go into your room, close the door, pray to me in the secret place, because what you do in secret, I reward openly. Mm -hmm. When you fast, don't go around people looking weak and ashy because you want them to feel sorry for you and admire you for fasting. You already have received your reward, but brush your hair, brush your teeth, put lotion on, look normal, look healthy, because I know what you're doing internally, and because of that, I'm going to reward you openly. So all of this stuff, people are doing all of these external things for likes and attention and to go viral and to and to and to grow their following. Right. Mm -hmm. They have their reward. Mm -hmm. Do the thing that God called you to do, regardless how many people see it. Start the Bible study, even if only four people show up. Hello. That was our testimony. If you get access to a space, go into the space and start hosting Bible study, even if there's only three of y'all in there. And be consistent as long as God tells you to be consistent. Whatever it is that he's told you to do, be consistent in doing it, and it will have fruit 